Hey, does anybody know who else's favorite song that is? Zach Chester, Chester, Nathan Johns. Yeah. Yeah, so if you can imagine, Amanda said, I said, just uh, think about uh, Zach Chester. And she says, I could just picture him. He would sit over here, and he would be dancing just like Marin was, (laughs) right? Uh, that That was his favorite song. That's awesome. Thanks so much. Appreciate uh, Shane, Amanda, Heather, and Steve uh, for leading us this morning. Um, thank you. And as Shane mentioned, that, that song fits perfectly with the analogy that we want to use this morning uh, in, uh, for, in uh, Titus chapter 1. So if you, if you have your Bibles, if you want to turn to Titus chapter 1, that would be excellent. I'll have that ready. Uh, f- and we're just going to look at the first four verses this morning. As we, we're going to go through the book of Titus. It's a short book, but we're going to go through it over these next four or five weeks. And uh, as, as, uh, as an importance of, by looking at what does it mean to build a godly church family? And uh, I think that's what God desires for us. Is that what you desire for us? Uh, is that our church be godly no matter what else happens around us? That we stay focused on what does it mean to be a godly church? Not that what do we do to do church things, but what does it mean to be a godly church? And so that's where we're going to be over these next, uh, these next few weeks. And I also just want to say just a a little acknowledgement that uh, um, I I didn't read it this morning, but it's it's worth mentioning. So um, for us, uh, and I, I, because it's going on in the back of my head and I have to just say it. So otherwise it'll just be occupying my mind. So this uh, (laughs) this weekend is uh, 30 years ago since my wife saw me and couldn't stop looking at me and uh, and and chased me down and said, I need to be with you for the rest of my life. And um, that's not quite how the story goes, but it was 30 years ago this weekend on a college and career re- young adults retreat in a little town called Arden, Ontario, where we, where we first uh, met. And, um, and so all these years later, here we are. Yeah. Yeah, living the dream. Yeah, so, yeah, she certainly covets your prayer for her uh, as uh, she endures. I said, do you, do you like this still, or do you just endure it? Uh, some, and so she chose silence uh, on, the, to <laughs> yeah, on, the, on the, to respond to that, to that question. But we are thankful for the way in which the Lord has guided us and, uh, and the opportunity he's given us together. Uh, to serve in many different ways uh, in many different places and uh, and so anyway you're part of that story and uh, we cannot forget that and so thank you uh, for your prayer for us and our family over these years as well and so as we as we go to God's word uh, would you pray with me and as we pray maybe there you know we don't come in uh, with uh, with just um, an empty space, right? We come with uh, things that trouble us, whether they're things in our own lives or things in the community around us or the world around us, and certainly there are lots of those, um, a long list of those things. There are things that occupy our our time and our, our focus. There are things that we hope that God doesn't point out uh, to us as well, uh, because if he did, then maybe we'd have to deal with them and, uh, and so with all of that, uh, may the Spirit of God have liberty in your life by His truth to continue to guide you into what it means to be a fully devoted, genuine follower of Jesus. So Father, as we come to your word, would you be our guide? Would you be our teacher? Would you be our helper? Uh, would you, God, uh, take those things that occupy our hearts and our minds? And uh, would you remind us that you hold those and maybe loosen our grip on that which we think we can't let go of? Speak your words into our lives and through us that you might be free to use us for your glory in the lives of others. So we pray for those 
around us, in front of us, and behind us, and beside us. We pray for those who are watching, and pray for our, those homes that, that this truth finds itself into. God, lead us by your truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to keep uh, Titus chapter 1 open. You know, it can quickly seem like, uh, seem a little longer, but it's just about a month ago that my wife and I uh, had the privilege of taking this vacation to Newfoundland. We went with another couple with whom we have enjoyed a long, mutually strengthening relationship. We've shared seasons of life together, the ups and downs of those ministry. We've shared leisure. We've shared a lot of food and a whole lot of fun along the way. They have family on the island, and they have been there so a lot of times. So they had some special places that they wanted us to see, as well as they wanted to use the opportunity for us together to explore some new places in Canada's most eastern province. One of those new places was the town of St. Anthony. Now, you don't stumble across St. Anthony because it lies at the very end of the Viking Trail on the most northerly tip of Newfoundland. It is quite a spectacular view and a place to visit. The place where we stayed was called the Grenfell Heritage Hotel and Suites. It was located right beside the Grenfell Museum. Across the street was the Boys and Girls Club, which was originally named the Grenfell Mission Orphanage. In fact, the Grenfell Mission gave origin to many other needed institutions, specifically in the areas of education and agriculture and industrial development. And across the road from the Boys and Girls Club, there was a hospital. You know what the hospital's name was? No, Charles Curtis Memorial Hospital. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, it was originally started by the Grenfell Mission Orphanage, named after Wilfred Grenfell. He first arrived in Labrador and then established himself in St. Anthony, coming from the United Kingdom as a medical missionary. He came on a fact-finding mission on behalf of the UKNMDSF. Of course, you know what that is, the United Kingdom's national mission to deep-sea fishermen. <laughs> On his first voyage, though, he was struck by the poverty and the absence of medical resources. He would return, not only to treat illness and disease, rather with an equal vigor, he would return in response to the impulse of the Spirit of Jesus within him, which was kindled by a gospel message he heard from renowned American preacher Dwight Moody. Of Dr. Grenfell, it is said, ahead of his time, he recognized that health was more than just the absence of disease. He possessed a profound Christian faith and believed that a vital part of his mission was to spread the word of God and to attend to the spiritual needs of those living on the coast. Dr. Wilfred Grenfell understood the importance of faith and good works of knowledge and godliness, of right belief and righteous action. In his lifetime, he led such, such transformational change to that area that his name still invokes respect and reverence and continues to inspire further social engagement that brings holistic improvement to that community. Since 1892... That's 130 years and counting. What began with one man continues through the foundation that bears his name and reflects his character. Today we start this new learning series in the, in the New Testament book of Titus. It's a short three-chapter book that holds within it a great richness of learning, particularly for building a godly church family. Together with the two letters of Timothy that preceded in your Bibles, they, they form what has commonly been referred to as the pastoral letters or pastoral epistles. And I think that's an unofficial, an unfortunate unofficial title because while they do provide some important teaching that's valuable for those who would serve according to their pastoral gifts, 
there is so much in here for every person. And I think sometimes when we think, oh, those are pastoral letters, then everybody else tunes out. This letter is written by the Apostle Paul towards the end of his life. It's a communication that he is intending to pass on to someone, being Titus, who will then pass it on to others. And as was the custom of the day, and we certainly see that in the other 13 letters that Paul has written, Paul begins with an introduction of himself as the writer, and then a reason for writing that everybody can see, and then a greeting that is uh, for the intended recipient, right? The writer, the reason, and the recipient. You know, in our firm, current forms of communication, we actually reverse the order, and we often neglect the sentiment that is found in these letters. Ancient times have a richness that we can appreciate. The writer is the Apostle Paul, and his own description of himself is brief and poignant. He views himself first as a servant or a slave to God. His first affection, his primary identity, is found in his relationship with God as one who is sent by Jesus. You see what he says? Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. This realization is one that has, that has been deepened in humility over the course of time, with the writing of this letter coming towards the end of his life. He doesn't speak of accomplishment, or he doesn't speak of the suffering he's endured. The title he chooses is one of a servant. And it implies that it is implied and amplified through the message he's about to share. Let's look at what the rest of the verse one says, and then going a little further for the reason for his writing. He talks about our faith or belief in Jesus isn't measured by what we know. It's actually measured by what do we do with what we know. See, he says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Now, different English translations will have communicated this using different words. And however, what they all share is a common purpose that our faith needs to be extended in keeping with its original intent. And so we read words like according to the faith or for the sake of the faith or to further the faith. And I picture it, as Shane mentioned, I picture it like a lighthouse. That's what I love about that, that choice of that song. With light that, beams of light that extend. They shine from it. They're meant to guide you somewhere. And notice here at the end of verse 1, we find the fullness of the reason for Paul's writing. Everything that he has to say from here on out in these short three chapters expands on this purpose. Now, many of us mistake the idea that our purpose as, of our, as followers of Jesus is to accumulate more knowledge. But Paul makes it very clear that the furthering of our faith includes the deepening of knowledge of the truth, but that's not where the sentence ends, does it? The knowledge of truth, he says, leads to godliness. They go together. And so what does Paul mean by godliness? Godliness is our active response to God's truth, which comes from a reverence and respect for who he is. Godliness speaks to our motive and our action. In fact, there are two different words that you'll find that show up through this book that most often get translated in our English, in our English Bibles as the word good. Each word is used four times. The first word refers to our motive, and you can see it mentioned in, in places like chapter 1 and verse 16. And if you want to underline or circle these, you can. Where Paul speaks to those who follow false teaching as having ungodly motivation. And he says they are not fit for doing anything good. In chapter 2 and verse 5, he spe when speaking of women, he talks about cultivating a godly motive for how they interact and engage with their families. In chapter 2 and verse 10, he talks about, when he talks about working relationships and how a motive of reverence and respect for God can influence those that we work among. And in chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul addresses all of us as citizens in, citizens in a community to, be, to use the freedom that we have to make the community a better place. In each instance... Paul is emphasizing the reverential aspect of godliness. The other word that is often translated as good refers to the quality of what we do. 
it presumes activity and outcomes. Let's look at four, the four different instances of this. It first is found in, in chapter 2 and verse 7. In speaking to men, Paul's encouragement is to remind them about, to go about their tasks with a commitment to excellence. When you do something, do it well. Not talking about perfection, but do it well. Actively choosing to do something well with integrity and dependability. That is goodness that's often missing in places in our society. And in chapter 2 and verse 14, we're reminded that because of the victory of Jesus on our behalf and the empowerment that comes from finding ourselves, our finding our primary identity in him, we have a renewed purpose. And in doing whatever we do with excellence, we don't just do things. We bring the goodness of God into whatever we do because of what Jesus has done for us. And in chapter 3 and verse 8, we're reminded that the truth and hope aren't religious fixtures to be hung on a wall or to kept to our gatherings. Rather, they ought to move us to do good. We ought to be eager to do good. And at the conclusion of this whole letter, at the end of these 46 verses, comes this reminder that the evidence of the truth that we contend ought that, uh, contend to be true and want people to believe ought to be demonstrated by our commitment to actively bring excellence into whatever we do. These two words, one which speaks to motive, the other which speaks to quality, radiate, expand, and extend the original concept of godliness, which Paul introduces to us here at the end of verse 1. The idea of goodness that is motivated from a reverence for God and commitment to excellence is a reflection of the original design of the world that God created. At each step of creation, he looked and he said it was good, that it reflected his nature, and it was excellent. When he created the human race, Adam and Eve, he then exclaimed that the whole of creation was very good and gave us the task of stewarding or managing the world by bringing his goodness to the people and the circumstances that we find ourselves in. You know, sometimes we settle for good enough or less than excellence in our motive and action. But maybe you've heard me say this before, but good enough is not good enough. For those of us who would recognize the lordship of Jesus in our lives, godliness is what he wants to work in you and through you. Don't let the mediocrity of those around you distract you from that. It gets easy to say, well, it's good enough for everybody else. Jesus wants you to shine brighter, and he can help you to do that. Godliness, the rightly motivated and excellence of action that flow from our growing awareness of Christ's love for us are like beams of light from a lighthouse. Those actions may be different for you than it is for me. Your context, your gifts, your strengths, your talents, the people that you interact with, your neighborhood, your workplace, your school— your season of life, they all influence the way in which you can demonstrate godliness. However, we must all remember that the lighthouse is the source and the lighthouse doesn't move. It is fixed. It is built upon a high and stable foundation and it's from within the lighthouse that the beams of light are sent out into all directions. The source, Paul reminds us as readers, is anchored in the hope that we have because of God who is eternal and whose promises endure forever. Our true confession of Jesus Christ as Son of the living God realigns our life and sets us upon the firm foundation of God's everlasting truth. When we confess our need for the forgiveness of Christ in our lives, he gives us the gift of his Spirit which is like a light that begins to shine through us and it exposes areas of motivation and it prompts us towards acts of excellence. As I've been learning, one of, one of Dr. Grenfell's greatest contributions was the petitioning of the authorities of the time to install lighthouses so that ships could pass through rocky, rocky waters in safety. His willingness to navigate the waters, even, even when the light was not provided, was a challenge to many. 
his goal wasn't to establish, wasn't primarily, it wasn't just medical. It wasn't establishing church services. His desire, his motivation was godliness. He wanted, this was establishing lighthouses was a good work done with a kingdom purpose in mind. And one of the many practical missing pieces in northern Newfoundland and coastal Labrador at the turn of the 20th century was the absence of these lighthouses. Dozens of shipwrecks lined the bottom of the ocean floor. And as a result, the idea of shipping resources to these remote communities seemed like a waste of supplies, a waste of time, and a waste of people. Dr. Grenfell made the truth of Christ tangible or manifest to the people with whom he connected. He, brought, he literally brought light to them, which was motivated from the working of God's truth in and through his life. So when we read, when we read in verse 3... Uh, that, uh, would, that God, in the hope of eternal life, at the end of verse 2, which God does not lie, promised from the beginning of time, and which now at his appointed season he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to him, to, entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. Some of, some of us can get a little disheartened when we read that, and we think, oh, well, I can't preach. I'm speaking to preachers. And so we limit the intention of, of Paul's words to a profession or to an action. Rather, what Paul is referring to is the importance of giving evidence to the eternal, to the presence of the eternal God within your time and space. Our motives and actions are to proclaim, to declare, or to, or to point toward Jesus as the source. That's what Paul is referring to. If Jesus is the light of the world and our actions are like beams of light, then what then are we responsible for? And so I'd like to liken that to that of a lighthouse keeper. The lighthouse keeper was to keep the light shining. They lived pretty simple lives. They were largely unknown except by the effect of their regular ability to keep the light shining. It wasn't a spectacular task. It required regular attention to detail, which, if done well, could provide safety for far more people than could be measured. On a normal day, the light would need to be on or burning from late afternoon till just after dawn. If a storm ro rolled in, then that time would be extended. How did he keep the light shining? By ensuring that the oil was full so the wicks would burn uninterrupted or that the lights were working as technology advanced. How did the light shine brightest? You're asking some really good questions, by the way. By ensuring that the lamp and the glass from which it was placed was clean. The cleaner the glass, the further the light could shine into the darkness. The promise of our new life in Christ is that we are fueled by the activity of the Spirit of God within us. We need to keep the vessel of our lives, our minds, full of His presence through regular refueling in His truth and being disciplined to address the dirt and the grime that prevents His light from shining through our lives. Those attitudes, habits, and actions that dim the reach of the light of Jesus want, and that he desires to extend through us. And that as we enter into confession to God, the windows of our souls are cleaned and his light is able to shine through. At the most northern tip of Newfoundland, in the town of St. Anthony, there's still a lighthouse. And it still streams beams of light across the surrounding. Yes, it is automated now. And, but it still stands atop a rugged cliff at the ocean's edge. And it is a legacy. The impact of that town, though, is not that lighthouse. The impact is the legacy of Dr. Wilfred Grenville. Because you can feel his presence still making a positive difference well over a hundred years later. One of his biographers says it this way. Always his beliefs must be expressed in good deeds. And his Christianity was ever seeking a practical expression. I think Titus would have made a great lightkeeper. He was a real deal. Titus 
is godly. Not because of what he knew, but because of his willingness to apply what he knew about Jesus to the simple things of life. The Apostle Paul knew this about Titus, which is why in this letter, which would have been read to the people of the churches on the island of Crete, they are met with this introduction to him. To Titus, my true son in our common faith. My true son, my real child. Paul wanted people to know that this guy was the real deal. He was genuine. He was trustworthy. All the characteristics that they had appreciated about Paul could be found in Titus. Because Titus was allowing the presence and the power of Jesus to direct his life. He had a proven track record developed over time. Titus is considered to be true, genuine, dear as a brother in Christ, because he extended the goodness of God through his life towards others. And you can look up this stuff later, but let me just briefly share with you a few things. In Galatians 2, Paul makes mention of Titus accompanying him to the council of, in Jerusalem. That, is, that episode is captured for us in Acts chapter 15. Titus was a Gentile, that is, he was a different ethnic background than the Jews. And he goes into Jerusalem to be an example of what faith in Christ could look like through somebody who wasn't Jewish, who didn't look like them. And that he didn't necessarily need to observe the old religious rules, which included circumcision. And there is Titus standing in a room with all these people who want to circumcise him. Titus was standing there in the midst of that. I'll let you figure out the pictures in your own mind. Years later, Paul would send Titus into the crazy world of Corinth to receive money that they were supposed to have been collecting to help other churches. You know, they set aside a little every, every week. And so listen to how Paul describes him in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and uh, verse 16. <clears throat> He says, thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he's coming to you with much enthusiasm on his own initiative. And we're sending along with him the brother who is praised by all churches for his service to the gospel. What is more, he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the, uh, as we carry the offering, which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself and to show our eagerness to help. We want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift. We are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. In addition, we're sending with them our brother who has often proved to us in many ways that he is zealous, and now even more so because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and co-worker among you. As for our brothers, they are representatives of the churches and, of, and in honor to Christ. And then towards the end of his life, towards the end of his life and his ministry, Paul finds himself in prison. And probably just prior to writing this letter, he reminds, he reminds us that Titus was with him in, pres in prison as he writes to Timothy as well. You see, Paul's commendation of Titus is not based on the clothes he wore. It's not his ability to excel at Bible trivia. It's not his stellar Sunday attendance. Paul has a deep endearment for Titus, not based on his ability to lead a Bible study or, or to preach a sermon or, or for any other reason like that. Titus is considered to be true, genuine, dear as a brother in Christ because he extended the goodness of God through his life towards others. And so as I close, let me, let me close uh, with a challenge from this quote that I came across. It says, there may be sections of the world where the method of presenting the gospel of Christ to men, which prevailed a couple of centuries ago, when actual information was necessary, will function to some extent today. But in the light of our modern world, it seems too cheap a price at which to purchase so great an end. If Christianity cannot be actively presented to the world, if its preachers are not leaders in deeds as well as in words, if our presentation of Christianity has nothing but philosophy to offer to life, then mankind has a right to demand some new religion which can adapt itself to our ever-advancing world. 
I could never believe that in every, but that in every man is born a spirit that is real, as well as a potential for sonship with God. Those are words by Dr. Grenfell in a little letter that he wrote called What Christ Means to Me. They were written over a hundred years ago. And they're relevant, probably even more so today. I hope you would agree. You know, the reach and the impact of a lighthouse extends well beyond from the place it stands. The means by which this takes place is through attention to keeping the light shining. Jesus wants to shine through your life. What areas of your life need cleaning in order for the light of Jesus to shine through? It's probably pretty easy to tell me what areas of other people's lives need to be cleaned. But that's not the question. The question is, what area of your life what motive, what habit, what attitude, what sense of mediocrity needs to be cleaned up in order for the light of Jesus to shine through? This is significant for all of us as we learn to develop as a godly church family. Because there are beams of light that, shine through the, that can shine through the way that we talk, the way in which we manage our resources of time and material that the Lord entrusts to us. There's, there's beams of light that extend through the trustworthiness and the integrity of our work, our initiative and our enthusiasm to listen well to others by the way in the time and the manner in which we interact online, by the way in which we notice what needs to be done and then we do it, and by the kind word that we can speak, by taking time to listen, to understand, by the notes of encouragement that we can write. And you know the list is endless and includes chocolate chip cookies. So let me ask you this. Where are you being challenged to keep the light of Jesus shining? The answer is going to be different for all of us. But the response is necessarily the same. We need to get cleaning. Let's pray together. So Father, as we uh, come before you, we give you thanks first and foremost for our lighthouse, Jesus, our Lord and living Savior. We thank you that as we place our faith in him, that he desires to shine through our lives. And Father, as we listen today, we, we're challenged in our motives, in our habits, in those things that we keep hidden. We're challenged by the way in which we might blame or look to others and wonder if they're going to get their lighthouses in order first. And so would you forgive us for our pride and our shame? Would you forgive us, Father, for <clears throat> those motives that we that we know are not right by you, that do not honor godliness. Father, would you challenge us towards excellence in our actions, whether we're in school or work or home and the sports teams we play in our, in our free time and in the interactions that we have in our neighborhoods. Father, may we bring the goodness of Jesus to bear in all those relationships and circumstances. Father, would you help us to take up the cloth, to wipe away, to clean the windows of our souls, that your spirit might shine even brighter through us. To the world around us, God, the darkness cannot stand against your light. May we shine forth as you lead us. We pray in Jesus' name.